Okay. Hello and welcome to Under the Superscope, where we take a look at some of the most famous games of all time and try to work out exactly what makes them so good, and whether they still hold up today. It doesn't matter if they're 5 or 35, all that matters is that they're fun. There are tons of great games out there in the wild, but only a few are truly masterful. A Link to the Past is one with such a pristine reputation, but in a world with the franchise's over a dozen more entries, and this particular one has a sequel, is A Link to the Past still one of the best games ever made? Well, let's find out. But first, let's examine exactly what The Legend of Zelda was before A Link to the Past. The Legend of Zelda was the adventure game. You're plopped into an open world with no direction, and the puzzle is to navigate, to stumble across dungeons and find secret paths, and basically become a master of this world. And I think it still mostly holds up. Every screen has a purpose, and it wasn't afraid to let the player work things out on their own. In a sense, open worlds regressed after The Legend of Zelda, and relied more on building sandboxes to hold linear missions than allowing the world to be the mission. But when it comes to dungeons though, Zelda 1 is all combat. Sure you'll push a block or bomb a wall, but in most cases all you'll be doing is clearing a room of enemies. And with the vile, over-the-top evilness that are the whiz robes and dark nuts, that's not always easy. Link can only move in a four-directional grid too, so you'll have to be really precise with both your attacks and your movement. While flawed in areas, Zelda 1's foundation can be seen in every other game in the franchise, and to an extent, the majority of games in the industry. Some secrets were perhaps a tad too cryptic, as their primary purpose was to sell a few more copies on Nintendo Power, but it also creates this social dynamic. Did you know about that bush you can burn? Did you know about that wall? There's a certain satisfaction to learning every single corner of this Hyrule. The gameplay may be stiff in areas, but the world is just as tremendous. Next, we have Zelda 2, something with a slightly lesser reputation. Much like Super Mario Bros. 2 and Castlevania 2, Zelda 2 didn't play it safe and went against many of the key fundamentals of its predecessor. For one, it was a side-scroller. While Zelda 1 was hard, Zelda 2 is freaking something else. It may be the black sheep of the franchise for many of its differences and unruly difficulty, but it was a necessary footstep to a link to the past. Zelda 1 represented a boy wandering around an empty forest. Zelda 2 is far larger in scope and has you visiting towns and talking to NPCs. Many of the franchise's RPG routes originate from this game, but of course the future was selective. The magic meter returned, but the leveling up system was essentially ditched. Deeper combat returned, but with the roots of Zelda 1's simplicity. This short retrospective was to show you how the team learned from both their highly acclaimed Zelda 1 and the lesser Zelda 2, and used the best of both to form something even better. Now, let's examine what makes A Link to the Past so good. Immediately, A Link to the Past shows us something neither Zelda 1 nor 2 told us directly through text. Story. Sure, all games have that scrolling backstory, but as soon as we start A Link to the Past, we're contacted telepathically by Zelda, telling us something's gone horribly wrong and she's trapped inside Hyrule Castle. Now, telling a direct story alone isn't effective. I mean, Zelda 2 told us everything we need to know just by spawning us by a sleeping princess. What A Link to the Past does constantly and effectively is use the narrative as a form of progression and direction. Now, that isn't to say that characters spout things like, Hey Link, try placing a bomb right here by this wall. I hear explosives are effective against living things and structures. <laughs> no, narrative is a gentle sway in the right direction here. As we exit Link's house, we're introduced to a world vastly different to what we saw in the original Zelda. Obviously, the tone is dark and foreboding, with eerie music and thunderous weather, and we can't really explore anywhere yet as guards are blocking every exit. For trying to explore, we aren't punished, but we're provided with context. When what are seemingly castle guards holding down the surrounding areas of the castle, something certainly isn't right. Make no mistake, these guys are roadblocks intended to stop us from exploring the world early, but they double as story pillars. As we move on, we're quickly introduced to a brand new element, puzzles. Now Zelda 1 had its fair share of walls to blow up, but A Link to the Past sets the gameplay tone early on. If you spend a while wandering around, Zelda will contact you telepathically again and give you a hint that there's a secret passage. She doesn't tell you exactly where, but as a first time player, if you are stumped, well, now you have a goal. Breath of the Wild actually does the exact same thing under the exact same conditions. Thank you. 
Head for the point marked on the map in your Sheikah Slate. Naturally, you'll eventually find this footpath leading towards an oddly suspicious patch of grass. We don't have our sword yet, but we're able to lift it up, and then make our way to the secret underground passage to Hyrule Castle. Immediately though, we've learned a critical skill. Interaction. The A button in A Link to the Past is used to move text along, pick up objects, and pull objects. It's a critical function that we're now subconsciously using on things we don't intend to kill. Then, as we travel down the passage, we find our uncle has been attacked. He informs us that Zelda is your... And then dies, while handing us the family sword. Anyway, now we have one of the most precious tools in the game, our sword. The sword functions extend far beyond that of Zelda 1, and with it we'll not only attack enemies, but also use it to solve puzzles. Importantly though, combat is so much better than the first game. Link no longer moves in a four-directional grid, and uses time away from the NES to work out a little. He's a lot more flexible, with essentially free-form movement and a much deeper combat system. Kinda like Zelda 2, many enemies now have shields that can block Link's attacks. It's not so much of a guessing game to where they'll block though, as the shield essentially acts as a small part of the hitbox that you can't attack. Kinda like the Dark Nuts in Zelda 1, but manageable. All of this is fine. This is not. The game gradually eases us into this, with the green soldier showing up alone on the screen at first, and then another appearing just moments after. Iteration is very important when teaching mechanics, as we need the space to learn what we can and can't do. If we were thrown into a room of five of these guys, it would be somewhat overwhelming. Even games famous for their difficulty, like Dark Souls, easy win with low-level enemies on one-on-one -on -one encounters. What this encounter also tells us is, if we had any doubt, the castle guards are certainly up to something. Now here's something I really like here. We picked up the lantern back at our uncle's house, and we're given the opportunity to experiment with it here. Our magic meter has been empty up until this point, so if we try to use it, we get a message telling us we don't have enough magic. So if we use the grab function we learned earlier, we can pick up these pots and find ourselves some magic jars. Then we can use our lantern on this candle and illuminate the room. We're not rewarded for this, but it gets us comfortable, and every single time you find magic jars under these pots, it's a very deliberate setup. Finally, we exit the passage, and here's something very important. The path we took lines up pretty much perfectly in the context of the world. A Link to the Past is very particular about this. Every screen makes sense, and links together in an organic way, and this context is later used to provide hints in dungeons. Like, you can just see another room out of reach, which gives you an idea of where they are in context of the dungeon. As we enter Hyrule Castle, the entire foyer is full of guards. Remember when I said earlier how dropping us into a room full of them would be poor design? Well, we've encountered a few of them now, and the game trusts we know how to fling our sword. Now it's time to continue to iterate. Hyrule Castle is essentially the first dungeon in the game, be it a mini one. There's tons of room to explore and different areas to visit, and though there's one particular way, we'll find it through trial and error. Zelda 1 did this too, but in its case it's more about blocking your path with locked doors. In A Link to the Past, Hyrule Castle is an actual place that you believe exists. These are just rooms of tiles. This is a castle with floors and rooms. If we go upstairs through this door on the left, we're introduced to one of A Link to the Past's most utilized visual gimmicks, layers. There are tons of Super Nintendo-specific features the game utilizes, like Mode 7 and sprite scaling, but one of the most clever visual enhancements is no doubt this. Almost every dungeon in the game has a room that overlaps with another. Sometimes the rooms will interact, and other times it's just context showing how everything flows together. But why is context so important? Well, with dungeon, you'll spend a lot of time navigating and trying to push onwards. And when we can picture how every room connects, we don't need to check our map, because we know exactly what's beyond this door and what this leads to. The map in Zelda 1 is near essential, as every room in every dungeon is practically just a square full of sprites. In fact, floors are a major part of A Link to the Past too, and certain dungeons make extremely clever use of them. Now we're introduced to the concept of locked doors, and to ensure we don't get confused, both the enemy with the key and the door are right next to each other, so you can't miss them. From here on, the game's able to get a lot more flexible with this concept, as just like with combat, it needs to make sure you know what you're doing first. Interestingly, this enemy is actually blue as well, which signifies that he's a higher class than the weaker green ones. Again, we're facing this guy in close quarters one-on-one, -on -one, before being exposed to far more of them. As we make our way through, we're completely sealed in with an enemy, with no option but to take them out. When we do, we get the iconic puzzle chime, and the door to our right, and the door we came through unlock. That's something we haven't experienced yet. We know that keys can open doors, and in fact there's a locked door right here, but we now know that some rooms have a criteria to meet to reveal their secrets. So now we have two paths, the locked door and the one on the right. We of course go the only way we can, being the one on the right. Earlier, the game kept the key and the door in the exact same room, and now they're starting to get a bit further apart. We also find the boomerang in this very room, and the game's giving us more and more options and more and more paths to take, and suddenly deviating from that path is starting to become encouraged. 
Now here's where the game gets on the floor and rolls around in context. We have two rooms with the sole purpose of having us travel downstairs. Did we need these? Not really, but it's again evolving the narrative. Zelda is being kept in the castle's dungeons, and we're witnessing it all firsthand without a whisper of dialogue since we entered the castle. Now just before we go and help out Zelda, we're met with an entirely new enemy. And as his weapon is long-ranged, you may want to try out that long-ranged item you just picked up. You don't need to though, you can lob pots or just time your sword swings, and that's kind of an interesting thing about items in Link to the Past. Many boss fights in particular don't revolve around an item like they do in later games, but the items can make them a hell of a lot easier. So depending on your playstyle, you may never really use much of your inventory, or you may rely on it the majority of the way. Once we save Zelda, she tells us there's a passage on the ground floor, and as we make our way back, we find a little shortcut which, again, uses the game's layers. Zelda is essentially a key for this segment. Later dungeons need a big key to open major doors, but with Zelda, we can work together to push this monument and slip away. This may be why the puzzle chime doesn't play, but either way, it adds so much to the atmosphere. Now we get another instance of hardware enhancements, lighting. The original Zelda had dark rooms like this too, but it was either pitch black or fully lit. Now in A Link to the Past, Link can cast his own light source, or illuminate the room using his lantern on the surrounding torches. This is actually the first instance where we're given a contextual use for the lantern. The boomerang is for long range combat, the lantern is for granting light. It makes sense that we don't face guards down here and instead battle rats and bats. This is a hidden passage that guards don't know about, and enemies work around this context. We're also facing them in different ways as they move around at a very different speed to the castle guards. In this short opening dungeon, we've learned exactly what A Link to the Past expects of us from navigation, combat, and puzzle solving. We know every key action, and mostly from our very own perspective, we know the story. Hyrule is being taken over, and even the princess is now in hiding. Now here's where the training wheels come off, and we're introduced to something very similar to the original Zelda. A fully open world, with even the same music. So how do we know where to go? Well, the priest marked her map with the location of the village elder, and so we head west and we find Kakariko Village, although when we get there, we learn the elder isn't actually around. What we had was a big X telling us where to go, and now the X is useless to us. We have to explore ourselves and ask the villagers for help. Stardew Valley does a very similar technique when you first move into your farm and have to talk to the local residents, and here in Link's the Past, we're made to learn about NPCs and how not all of them are friendly. In fact, one calls the guards on us and claims that we're a wanted man. The priest said earlier they may be looking for us, but here we learn that we're the ones being blamed for the disappearance of Princess Zelda, all with only a few lines of dialogue that lead into gameplay. What Kakariko Village immediately showcases is how alive this rendition of Hyrule is. Everyone seems to have a believable life, and it's so compact. Throughout the entire game, there's no wasted space. Every NPC placement has a purpose. Every building has a purpose. This is how the basis of navigation works in the links to the past. Dungeon locations are always placed on the map, but it's not always as simple as just walking over to them. You'll often have to find an obscure way through via mazes, birds, or even through worlds. Every basic mechanic we've learned in what's perhaps 20 minutes of gameplay is iterated and expanded upon throughout the entire adventure. Eastern Palace uses layers to make a larger dungeon seem smaller as not to intimidate the player. On your way to Desert Palace, you'll find your path blocked by text that you can't read. When stuck in the Link to the Past, what you can do is speak with the fortune teller who points you in the right direction, but rarely will the game just do it for you. There are moments where you're expected to explore and work it out on your own. Now that you have the Pegasus boots, you can chase down that guy in Kakariko Village, and he advises you that bashing into trees can grant items. That bash has another use though, and that's where this mysterious book comes into play. Many skills are transferable. Desert Palace is interesting as it essentially combines two smaller dungeons together, and the Power Glove item we find here opens up the path to the next dungeon. Tower of Hera uses switches to manipulate the dungeon, and layers are now used to physically fall from floor to floor. I hate this boss, he's evil and I hate him. Every single dungeon has a unique twist, whether it's how you navigate, how you move, or some rely around specific items. Of course, once you finish the first three dungeons, you're introduced to Link's Excalibur, the Master Sword. A Link to the Past adapted the Zelda lore into what it is today, fully explaining what the Triforce is and creating a wider continuity that even then was up for interpretation. Even melodies such as Zelda's Lullaby and the theme of the Master Sword originated from A Link to the Past.
The game uses a common trope of Zelda in the way of mini finales. Notice the pattern of how both A Link to the Past and Ocarina of Time have you complete three dungeons and then introduce a handful more while drastically changing up the world? It's no coincidence. A Link to the Past is pretty much perfectly paced from beginning to end, and this split in acts grants a sense of accomplishment that motivates you to carry on. Defeating Agahim is like a mini final boss that comes a third of the way into the game, and it adds as both a breather and a signifier that the player is ready for something more. Enter the Dark World. A Link to the Past is twice as large as initially thought, and from here on in you have to manipulate your way through slightly differing structures of light and dark. Much of the Dark World is barriered off by items found in later dungeons like the Hammer or Hookshot, and so what you may have to do is find other ways around it, utilizing the Light World. It creates this invigorating balance of finding the secrets of both worlds, and A Link Between Worlds doubles down on this, where essentially every dungeon requires you to switch between both realms. Sometimes you can just stay put in the Dark World and A Link to the Past. What's interesting is you can enter most dungeons in any order. Your only barrier is the items in your inventory. It's not recommended, as sometimes you run into roadblocks where you need an item that you simply don't have yet, but it's great to have as an option and can drastically shake up repeat playthroughs. There's this really clever puzzle in the Ice Palace where you have to drop a block down from the ceiling, navigate all the way around and then push it onto a switch. It makes amazing use of the game's layers, but if you did Misery Maya first, you can just do this. There's another clever puzzle in Gargoyle's Domain, where you need to place a bomb down and throw it over the fence and onto this destructible floor. But how do we know about throwing bombs? Well, whenever you get a bomb out of a chest, it actually tells you, and it just so happens there's a chest with bombs in right here. Whenever a room gives you an item, that's a sure indicator that you'll be needing that item, and putting them in the chest here is a very deliberate way of suggesting you need to throw the bomb. Gargoyle's Domain also finishes off with a brilliant fake-out, with a maiden who refuses to go outside. So you use a puzzle to expose her to rays of light, again using layers to shine light onto the room below. A Link to the Past loves layers, and sometimes A Link to the Past thinks it's a bullet hell game. A Link Between Worlds took the idea of freeform dungeons further by bypassing dungeon items in favour of an overworld rental shop, but I feel dungeons housing items was a concept that didn't need to be fixed. There's a certain excitement of awaiting the next dungeon and seeing what item you get, and then the dynamic of the dungeon changes halfway through. For instance, Swamp Palace begins as a dungeon where you navigate by changing water levels in its first half, and then in the latter half you'll be using your hookshot to get around, which then culminates in a boss battle that mixes together everything you've learned. The item rental system isn't exactly worse, but it isn't exactly better either. It fits the more open style of A Link Between Worlds, but the pacing of A Link to the Past wouldn't really accommodate for it. This game purposely segments parts of its world behind items, as there's a difficulty progression to each dungeon, but all in all, there's no dauntingly large dungeon in A Link to the Past. The game moves on from each location so rapidly, and there's never any padding or downtime in between. You're always going to the next big thing, and just like the original Zelda, every screen has a purpose. Some of those cryptic secrets did carry over to A Link to the Past, but none are mandatory. Anything that requires your attention to defeat Ganon is told clear as day through visual and contextual hints. Other things like running into this wall you don't need to do, but it serves that satisfaction of knowing the world and its secrets. A Link to the Past is an unforgettable journey full of so many iconic pillars of what makes Zelda, Zelda. The team perhaps made the greatest game of all time with masterous mechanics that are intelligently taught. Whether it's one of its tightly crafted boss battles or miraculous level design, A Link to the Past does more than hold up. It's still a shining standard to what video games can be. Ever wondered why Link's hair is pink in game while blonde on the artwork? It's a metaphor for A Link to the Past setting its own rules. I actually don't know why it's pink. Ocarina of Time may have jumped into a new dimension with a further emphasis on puzzles, but in all the years of this franchise, I don't think anything has touched a link to the past in pure consistency. Also, to steal from Andre, the map adjusts itself to the game's time of day, even though it's only dark at one specific moment in the game, and that's something you just can't beat. Thanks for watching, and be sure to subscribe to Game Explain for more episodes from Under the Super Scope and other things gaming too. Catch you next time. Bye.